Hi. Welcome back to a nomad tale. In this episode, we spend our precious vacation time chasing storms. Then, we set our pass back up only to find someone really wants it to stay down. And somewhere along the way, we get a glimpse at the largest military base in Anoikis. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. So, I am beginning a journey, a short journey, to Sanchez base. What we're going to do first is run over to Hikoken. And once we're in Hikoken, we're going to jump into a wormhole. Okay, so we have arrived at Thera. Okay, so just in case you do not know what Thera is, Thera is a very large named system in JSpace. And what this system is good for, I mean, you could live here, there are stations here even. But what this system is actually good for is leveraging the many, many, many static systems that it has as a form of travel. So, we were in Jitta less than, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes ago. And now, with no filaments, no jump drives, nothing else, look where we're about to be. We're in stain. So this is uh, an example, a really, really good example, <laughs> I should add, of um, how you can use Thera to get from one point to another. This is the galaxy, this is the Empire in the middle. We're all the way down here. And this is Sancho Space. This is where a storm is. Now, I'm a couple jumps out from the storm. Basically, the way this works is the storm gives you bonus to scanning, gives you bonus to hacking, gives you a bonus to capacitor, and it makes more relic spawn. Overall, it makes everything really easy, except for the fact that you cannot cloak, right? That's the problem. So you gotta be quick, you gotta be deliberate. You should not cherry pick, but you can cherry pick for the first scan of a site to find the good loot, and then you go back and blow up the cans, that's acceptable. But you don't cherry pick because these sites respawn within a couple jumps, so. You want to completely clear them, if possible. And there's 20 mil in our first can, in the storm. Alrighty. Off to the races. Six mil. Not the greatest, but we'll take it. And there's five mil, little easy one. And there's eight mil. All right, 20 mil. All right, 17 mil. Sweet. And there's 61 mil. Here's another 45 mil can. All right, a little quick 21 mil here. Scoop that up. Wow, that was the fastest 21 mil I've ever had in my life. That was one second. 21 mil per second, that's a new level of this per hour right there. 21 mil times 3600, someone do the math. It's a lot of, it's a lot of Skrilla. And there's 15 mil. There's a quick little 9 miller right there. And there's a 15 miller. 
And there's an 85 mil can. Pretty happy about that. Okay, there is a 30 mil can. Same side as the 84 mil can. There's 20 mil. That's 78 mil right there. Okay, there's 10 mil. 8 mil can right there. 17.5 million. 26 million. 35 million. 12 million right there. 43 million grease the can. 9.5 mil serpentis. 7 mil serpentis. 22 million. And here we have 40 mil. 21 million. 9 million Sancha. 25 mil. Followed up by 10 mil. 17.6 million. All right. 57 million. That'll go right in my pocket. 49 million right there. 10 mil can right there. Quick 10 mil right there. Well, there is a 26 mil can. Followed by a 9 mil can. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's 83 mil right there. I think this was 140 mil in one site, something like that. Whoa. Okay, a lot of you guys are going to know about this beforehand, but I'm going to talk about it now. And we're just going to do this now because why not? It's a good point. Um, being a nomad, you have to understand how Thera travel works and how Poshfin hauling works. Thera travel makes sense to a wormholer. You have a wormhole called Thera with a bunch of statics that lead all over New Eden. So you can pop in one of them, hop in Thera, and then pop out another one for travel. It makes sense, right? But Poshfin is new to me, and I've used it several times, many times at this point now. But it's pretty busted, and we're going to go through it right now and show you exactly what it, what it is and how to do it and why it's busted. So to Poshfin Hall, you basically form a fleet, and then you have two items that you purchase from Jetta beforehand. You have a Border 5 Poshfin filament and a Proximity 5 Extraction filament. You don't have to worry about what they are. Anything, they're cheap. I think this one's a couple mil, but the other ones, they're cheap. Basically, how this works, if you activate a border Poshvin filament, you'll be teleported from where you are to a particular area of Poshvin. All of your loot will come with you. Of course it will. It's in your ship. Then you're going to get a weapons timer, or sorry, a uh, aggression timer for like 30 minutes or something where you can't use another one. So what you do is you use the first one, you get the aggression time, you cloak up, you wait. When that's up, then you use your proximity, and that pulls you to case space. Depending on where you are in Poshvin, you actually can predict where you come out, but for us it's not too important. So this is how this works. You form a fleet, you decloak, you get away from any objects, you can't be near any objects, right? You with me? And then you simply activate the board of five, just like this. Use it. Make sure you don't have a log off timer. If you do, you cannot do this. But you activate your board of five, and what's going to happen is you're going to end up right in Poshvin, right? Push your cloak right away, push your micro right away, burn off. I like to go up, down, better than left and right. Anyway, so now we're in Poshvin. If you've never seen Poshvin, it's, it's a spooky looking place, right? I mean, look at that. Yeah, very spooky. Uh, Poshvin has like permanent weather effects and all types of crazy things that we're not even going to get into. All you need to know is that we were just in the south, in Paragon's Soul. And we used an item, and now we're in Poshvin. So you can see how that's powerful. So there's two ways out at this point. The first one is to wait the timer up here. We have 14 minutes left. I think I said 30 before. I meant 15. We have 14 minutes left. And then we can use this to go to case space. Alternatively, what you'd have to do is to start scanning signatures down in the Poshvin systems. So I'd scan this system down. If it's a wormhole, it probably leads out of here. Or it does leave out of here, for sure. And if there wasn't one in this system, I'd go to the next system and scan down some more signatures. However, Poshvin is very harsh. It's very densely populated compared to J-Space. I mean, relatively speaking. 
and it's very dangerous and all null rules apply has the lo delayed local like wormhole space so you definitely don't want to be jumping around from system to system like a dum-dum and not know what you're doing so I highly suggest using the Border 5 Poshrin and the Proximity 5 Extraction so that you can totally ignore the gates and scanning. Just use one after the other, and then you'll get out of here. So we'll cut right back when our timer is up in 13 minutes, and then we'll see how to leave Poshrin and get to Jitta. Okay, here we are. After 15 minutes, the log-off timer has expired, and now we can use our Proximity. Element. Uh, before we do that, I want to show you what this actually does because it's one thing to just use this stuff and not and not understand it and benefit, but it's another thing to understand it as well. Let's make sure you understand it. So, Poshvin is basically a big triangle. It doesn't look like a triangle here, but essentially you have three sides, right? One, two, three, something like that. And there's a bunch of systems. It's the red lines. Um, the border teleports you at a certain point on those lines, basically, there's a certain amount of eligible systems for each border, something like that. I think what it does is pretty much all the systems except for like the corner ones. Either way, that doesn't matter. Just un just know that it teleports you to a, a bunch of predetermined locations. Right now, we got really lucky. Look where we are. We got teleported to our Vasaras. And remember, Poshfin uh, apparently was created out of existing systems so they have relation to k-space systems so right now we're in poshvin which is our Varsaras, but we're also in this big mess of systems right next to jitta jitta is this home station icon here now the reason i'm showing you this is because when we use this proximity extraction what that does is as the name belies it extracts you to a proximate system in that case, being a system within a certain amount of jumps from this area, if it, like maybe light years from this area, right? What happens is if we decloak and use this extraction, what's gonna, it was gonna teleport us to probably one of these systems on our screen now. So but let's just do that now. Make sure you're away from stuff too before you use filaments or they won't work. If we decloak and we use activate. Okay, let's see where it puts us. Remember, we're right here currently. And go ahead and cloak up as soon as you can. And look where we are. It teleported us right next door. From here to here. Literally right next to it. And how cool is that? Because now, look where we are. Three jumps from Jetta. Okay? So even if the border doesn't put you right next to Jetta like it did this time, it'll put you like over here, over here, or something. Worst case scenario, you gotta go through a Bazin, I think. But that's, that's no problem. In a Kovops, that's no problem. So what we just did there is called Poshvin Hauling. You use a filament to get to Poshvin, and then you use a different filament to teleport out of Poshvin. And you can do that anywhere in K-Space. What ends up happening is you go do your hacking, do your, or whatever you want to do, and then you Poshvin Haul your loot back to Jetta. Um, it's really just kind of like the most safe and, in a way, brain dead. If you combine it with downtime tanking, it's virtually unbeatable, right? So, it's a very important thing to know for nomading because remember, we could be doing this with our crane or a DST. You can't filament out of J space, but you sure as heck can filament right outside of your exit. That's Poshvin hauling. That's how you can get from anywhere you want in Empire, anywhere, deep south, west, anywhere. Drone lens back to Jitta in, you know, about under a half an hour. You know, close to 20 minutes if you're really fast. Very important skill to know. Between Thera and Poshman hauling. Yeah, that's gonna get you where you need to go. Okay, so today is day 62. And after doing some storm chasing and taking a little break from Anoikis. I have decided I already want to get right back into it. So what does that mean? Well, as we discussed at the end of last episode, I took down my tower and hid all of my assets. So to get back into it, we have to anchor the tower again and then relocate all of our assets back inside of it. Not a big deal, right? So we're going to wait for this timer. We're going to online it. We're going to throw some fuel in it. 
we're going to move everybody inside of it. And then, when downtime is about to hit, we're going to log our Orca back in and fly him into the POS. Um, so we're going to skip around a little bit and show you how this is done. And then we're going to get back into scanning and hacking and huffing and scooping and killing and... Yeah. All the good stuff we like, so... Let's watch us uh, pop this tent back up, though, first. So strangely enough, I dropped the tower and it's not in the same location as before. I think it snaps to it, though, right? Is that what happens? I can't remember. I think when this finishes anchoring... It's gonna move. We'll see, though. Nope, it actually stayed there. Whoa. Huh. Surprised by that. Okay, well, I have to move my pings. <laughs> All of my pings don't work anymore. Oh well. back up where we left off. Okay, so we have anchored it, we have onlined it, one thing left to do. Give it a password. And there you go. Okay. Okay, wow. Um... Yeah, it's been like 20, 25 minutes, I want to say, since I decided to scan my main back into the hole from scratch. And I built a new map, scanned it down, and got my main in that fast. That's kind of impressive. Um, the, <laughs> the reason why it was so fast was because uh, I scanned down a class 2 and it had a high sec exit, and the high sec exit was 5 jumps from Jetta. Um, so that's awesome. So now we are almost completely set back up. We have but one thing left to do. And that, of course, is... Oops. Getting the Orca in the force field. This is really low risk, what we're doing here. There's almost no reason why I would want to down tank tank... Or downtime tank this, excuse me. Uh, the reason I am gonna downtime tank it is because I want practice with the timing and any excuse I have to fly the orca I'm taking it just for more experience so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna wait another 20 minutes or so we're gonna log that orca in we're gonna fly right on into the pass okay five minute warning right there um I think I logged in at three minutes last time um, again, this is probably the most low risk thing you could do with the Orca. So I'm not sure any of this is going to make any difference. Um, the one thing that we do want to keep in mind is that if somebody is really smart or whatever and knows we're doing this, they could put up a drag bubble, etc, etc. So we do need to keep eyes on grid to make sure nobody bubbles before we click the warp button. Right? Right really the main advantage to doing it at downtime any movement at downtime is it's going to take one or two guys a long time to get through the orca in time all right we're gonna log in go ahead pull the orca in How I'm going to do this is line, descan the whole time, I'm 
micro on, micro off, home base align. Give it another cycle. And then we're gonna check this grid here. Then once our speed reaches 75 over here with these scans, it's probably good now. What we do is we descan here, we descan here, we descan here, we descan here. Nothing, 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 nothing. We warp. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And we're in warp, which means now if somebody bubbles here, we'll go right through it since we started the warp beforehand. Um, obviously, we did two micros there because we're not in travel fit, and even if we were in travel fit, we'd have to overheat it. So that's why we took so long to warp off. But again, this is the low risk orca move, so I consider this to be practice. And it is funny, looking back on older videos, I do cringe when I see myself move the orca without downtime. It just doesn't make sense to move it without downtime. There's no reason to do it, so. Okay. We uh, took a little vacation. We shut down the, the camp. We made some money, we had some fun. And we popped the camp right back up in under an hour. So I was not subscribed on both of these accounts one hour ago with no pos nothing set up and now we're completely good to go how cool is that okay so after setting back up and getting everything good to go fueling up the pos we have scanned some systems down and we have immediately found a go site how cool is that right um so we actually have Hacking 5 now. It's been long enough. We have Hacking 5. Um, there you are. That unlocks the full Astero fit with the Zygma Analyzer. And on top of that, we have the Black Glass Implant, which makes our power 60, right? So we have low health on our virus, but we have extremely high damage. So in theory, we should be able to pop, 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 pop through the, uh, the relics, right? If all goes to plan. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna warp there at 100. I'm gonna make a ping. I'm gonna warp to the ping. And I'm gonna warp to a can, start the timer. I'm gonna hack my ass off. I'm gonna try to get two to three cans without cargo scanning and see if this is possible. The things I need to consider is that I need to overheat my partner the entire time. I can only take two shots, ideally only one. And you need to click warp the second the rats come, even if you're in a hack, you just have to tank it. So, with that in mind, I think we'll be fine to go in. What we do is we warp in at 100. And we'll make a little ping. Okay, made a little ping. We'll go back to it. Now, in theory, I've been told multiple things on this. In theory, the timer should only start when we decloak, right? Right. So, what that means is we ought to be able to warp right to one of these cans, yeah? And that's exactly what we're going to do. So, I'm going to... Warp. See how this goes. <laughs> we're gonna start the timer as soon as I decloak right now. And we're gonna try, we're gonna try, try, try. Okay, hack. I'm pretty nervous about this. Wow, it's taking me so long to get through here. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So we're 30 seconds in. Okay, 30 seconds. Let's go to the next one. 
30 seconds in, we're watching for rats, we're on approach, micro's off. Okay, we got this one, go to the next one. Micro, rats, not here yet, micro on, micro off, approach, lock. And we run this. Waiting for rats, waiting for rats, waiting for rats. Trying to look for rats. Okay, we got that. And lastly, this one, we have 118. Let's see if we can do it. We're being really greedy here to test it. Looking for rats, we're really looking for rats now. We did it. With that, and we warp off. Okay, that is the idea. Got all four cans. Didn't even break a sweat. Actually, I'm not gonna lie. I'll totally be honest with you. I'm super nervous doing that because I know how expensive this ship is. Woo! So it honestly looks like we didn't get a whole lot here, <laughs> sadly. So, okay, we looted four cans and we got like under 100 mil, right? That's okay, amazing practice, right? So, um, pretty happy about that. But yeah, I mean, the fact that I got all four and it was like a minute 40, two minutes, something like that, no problem. I mean, shh. That makes me really like this setup. I was worried I wasn't gonna get that many cans. And I'll be honest, I really struggled on the first hack. I was, I was like a little bit of shaky shake going on. So that first hack was really dirty and took me forever, right? So I think I can do it cleaner next time. The Zugma Analyzer really makes this possible. I mean, fuck. You can seriously, seriously hack quick with that bad boy. Anyway, awesome. Yeah, so I'm just lazily doing these gas sites in the passive regen sweeple. And somebody just combat scanned me. And I just warped off to a ping. So that was kind of scary. I was barely paying attention to. Like, I barely caught it. They pulled the probes, like, two scans after I started scanning. So... Needless to say... I don't think we're gonna farm in this hole. Alright, so we're gonna pop into this Class 5. And see what's shaking in here. It is a Naglfar within a POS. So this will be fun to check out. Put a frame rate lag there. Go ahead and save that bookmark right there. We'll link it up on Pathfinder. Go ahead and copy these in while we still have Gate Cloak, right? Go ahead and throw them into Pathfinder. Sweet. So now we have the SIGs loaded into Pathfinder. Now, what do you do? Hmm, good question. Well, I'm going to start here. Looks like we've got ourselves an Astra House with double force fields, right? What do we do? We're not gonna launch probes, we're not gonna run around. We'll take a look first. So our Loki is visible on D-Scan for, I don't know, somebody probably knows the math, but I don't. Probably about five to 10 seconds. When you go into a new wormhole, if you don't launch your probes, you can simply fly off and the chances of somebody D-Scanning you very low. What are we doing here? So we're looking for a bunch of different things here. We're looking for people in the Citadel. There are none. We're gonna look at the actual Citadel ownership itself. It is known as Somi Standing. Do a little Z kill here. Three members. Looks like they join bigger fleets. Perhaps this is somebody's personal alt corp, right? So they have an Astra House here. And they have a Naglfar in there, right? So, take a look at the Nag. So, whose is this? On the breach, okay. So this is somebody's farming Nag right here. Looks pretty, huh? Wow, look at that.
might be asking yourself, why did I have to go back and get the cheetah? The simple answer is, I don't trust posses to not decloak me when I warp there. They are strangely placed. I think you can warp to the uh, the uh, moon warp in at zero, and you should be good. But if you descan first and check for bubbles and stuff, but I uh, like to bring the co-ops just to be extra careful. So let's get out of here before this wormhole collapses. Now that we've got to look at the nag and. Uh, yeah. Be happy. So we have indeed covered how to use Thera to get to where you're going. Um, in some cases it could save you hours of travel, in other cases it might just be safer, right? And probably as a new player, you don't consider Thera to be safe, but if you adhere by the standard protocols for being safe anywhere, then there is really not that bad. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our connection, hopefully beat it because it's end of life. Um, I'm not scouting it right now because I like to live dangerously. Um, so we're gonna run to our connection, but to get there, instead of jumping all the way through a space and through a basin and taking forever to get there. I'm just going to center our crane through Thera. I'll show you how easy this can be. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to get to Altaris. Two jumps out from here. And then we're going to refit the crane. Okay, now that we are at our last high sec system before reaching low sec we will go into a station and do a quick little baby refit so we open up our fittings we pull these off put that on put that on put that on the reason for this is that it makes us significantly safer going through Thera but we kept the EHP on in high sec because we don't want to get tornadoed, right? Same stuff we talked about earlier. But since we're going through Thera, we need to equip ourselves to be fully null sec and NOIC is ready now. Even though we're just going into low sec. Okay, so now we're here. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use... Um, oh, we don't have it on here. So this is perfect, I actually get to show you. What you do is you go to your chat panel, open chat channels, type in scout, join it. Now you got this window, right? Roll up a little bit, look for this cyan blue Thera. Go ahead and click it once, click connect, close out Eve Scout, unless you want to talk to them. Keep it there then. That is a lot of redeemers on scan. And then once you uh, do all the things I just said, what happens is now you have a publicly updated list of all the Thera bookmarks. You don't even have to scan anymore to use Thera. Right? Right. So, now... There's a bunch of blobs in here, it's creepy. Anyway, so now we go to the connection. We don't even have to scan. Let's go, go, go. set our destination to be our hopeful entrance. And since we have Warp Core Stab and Nullification, we just send it right into Thera, no scouting required. If there's anybody there, we will simply activate both modules and warp off, right? Okay, just a bunch of probes on scan. So, now what do we do? Now, find the closest system or target. If we type in Wadala in the Eve Scout website, closest way out is a system called Netsalaka in the Bleak Lands. Get there. Use this right here. Okay. Beautiful. Let's 
See how the black box popped up? I had to click it again. Good example of it. Probably don't want to click your modules either. Sometimes I do it out of laziness, I'll be honest. Okay, so we were just in Jan, a couple jumps from Jitta. And we are in Thera now. We're popping out of Thera. We are only five or six jumps from where we gotta go. That was a lot of work as well. So, this doesn't save us like a ton of time, but it saves us the drama of dealing with a Bazin. It saves us several jumps. We don't have to do any scanning at all, thanks to the guys at Eve Scout, guys and gals over at Eve Scout. And, um, crucially, I mean, this is seriously the most important part. Um, makes you feel like a badass, you know, when you take Thera to get around. Makes you feel like you know what you're doing. But anyway, I guess we'll just see if that connection is still there when we get there, because again, haven't scouted it in the last hour, I know it was EOL, so let's see how that goes. Okay, well, how about that? I think our connection is still here. That makes me one happy panda. Wait, pandas in this game are frat, right? Crap, I can't call myself a panda. That makes me one happy hippopotamus. Okay. Not the biggest shortcut in the world, but um, having the ability to... Well, they're both crit, or both EOL. Funny. Having the ability to go through Thera, if nothing else, gives you options. And options lead to better decisions. So, I wanted to show this little segment to really drive home the point that whenever you're traveling any long distances, your first thought should be... Does Thera get me there quicker? Not should it shouldn't be something you think about after, right? So, anyway, cool. We made it back. Okay. So this is a bit of a um, maybe weird one. I would describe it as. So what we have today is the entrance to Laserhawk's headquarter system. Now, full disclosure, and I'm not ashamed to say, I did not find this on my own. I was given a connection by somebody who stumbled upon it, we'll go with. And um, my only intentions are to go in there and to look around and to leave. I'm not even going to bother to put a seed. So now that that is out of the way, let us take a look at the biggest wormhole PvP group in the game right now what their headquarters looks like you're going to go ahead and divert your eyes down to the d scan here and you're going to notice a fair amount of portazars and force fields in here now this does not come as a surprise to me however even though i was warned of the quantity i am still rather amazed by it so what we're going to do is take a look at a stack of faction Fortizars that, with all due honesty, might be a bit over the top. So, okay, let's take a look. Look at that. Good lord. Let's just add these to our main overview now so you can take a look at what we're dealing with here um, and these are going to be held by you know rainbow knights here if you don't know what you're looking at here you're looking at just untold billions of isk these are not just normal citadels all right these are faction fortizars okay so a fortizar is already pretty dang expensive right you and me, a Fortizar is probably out of our grasp to not just buy an anchor, but to defend, right? Okay, there is a 
a dread right there. Don't see that every day. Maybe in this system you do. So there is a dread landing right now at one of the many, many Fortizars. There's 14 people in this one. All right, let's not get distracted by the dread. Let's let's uh, keep looking at these. So, long story short, these cost more. They uh, purportedly are stronger, and they are harder to crack, right? And if you're like me and not really informed as to why the heck a group this powerful would use Fortizars, which are the middle tier instead of the highest tier Citadel, which are Keep Stars, why you would choose to use Fortizars. I had thought about it for a little bit and I just couldn't understand why they did it. And somebody told me that it is more than likely, or you might say definitely, because of the fact that the Fortizar has a smaller grid size. And if that revelation doesn't really ring any bells in your head, it doesn't make you start thinking, you're like, okay, what does that matter? Well, it matters a whole lot, apparently. The fact that the Fortizar are smaller than a Keepstar means you can get away with doctrines that can cover a lot more of the overall area of the building. So what does that mean in the real world? That means that this Fortizar, the faction Fortizars, these are, some of them are regular as well. You can see they have a lot of regular ones, but these faction Fortizars in particular, these are extremely hard to kill. And the fact that they have so many means you can't just headshot one. You can't just focus everything on one. You would have to quite literally... Um, I mean, I was going to maybe just opine about some way you could do this, but I don't think it's actually possible to evict these guys. I think um, failure would have to come from within for a group this large, right? I guess we just keep looking at these... This is a normal Fortizar, right? This is what they looked like back when they were released. There were no faction ones. So we saw the Dracus, that's the Amar one. Do we have any... Okay, here's here's one. This is my favorite looking one. I, oh, I love this one. I'm so happy they have one. Look at that. I know it's like not fancy, but it's like compact and it looks just... It looks war ready. And like with the shiny hologram sides, this looks like an actual like stronghold to me. I really like the way this looks. This is hands down my favorite one. Um, so we have also the Galente one. I think this is Galente. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Maybe pirate fat, hybrid, whatever. I really like the way this one looks too. Um, we saw this one in the MGLA system. But uh, obviously it looks better here since it's flanked by every other type. Oh, look at this. This is the Kaldari faction, Fortizar. It's like a fishing dock. I mean, that's just... That doesn't look defensible or sturdy or imposing, but that looks cool. Especially with the Rainbow Knight little dude there. It looks so good on the holograms. That kind of sets the bar, doesn't it? They just put a saber next to the MTU. Where's the trust? Come on, where's the trust? Okay, so we logged in today and... Looks as though somebody was shooting our past today. 
Looks like somebody is currently bashing it. Amazing. So I have two options, basically. I could build some ships and try to shoot these guys. Probably would not be hard to beat these ships with my ships, but... Um... Yeah, I'm not sure what I want to do. We'll think about it for a little bit and come back to it. They did ref it. Okay, interesting. Are they hitting a fucking Poco? Oh, they're in the middle there. What the heck? Oh, they're there. Whoa. Yeah, so it looks like they're bashing a dead stick now after they raft mine while I was sleeping. So... Not too sure what's up with that. We're gonna do a little bit more scanning and see if we... are 100% sure where they are. Yeah, they're definitely there. It looks like they're just bashing that. It's pretty nuts. Oh, Jesus, don't decloak me. Oof. Oof, that was close. I was really close to a decloak, I think. 12km. Could be a bad idea, this could be a good idea. Not really sure. kill both the oracles and I think the other guys should leave. If they don't, we'll try to kill them and burn tackle. Best we got. We'll go for the bottom one on this guy. Tackle you. 
and you're gonna want to just stay back maybe start aligning out the sun even would work It'd be nice to get the kiki more actually first i think would be ideal but i'm gonna wait till he spins around and then pick off these guys that's the play See what we got. Worst case scenario, we lose a bunch of ships. Okay. Yeah, so hey, it's me from the future. Um, for some reason, the combination of no game sounds and no commentary for this fight was really creepy. So I'm gonna do a little bit of commentary over the top, all right? So I decloaked my Proteus, locked up both targets, did the same with my Loki. The Proteus immediately applies all of his modules onto the first Oracle, and the Loki points the second Oracle. These are polarized oracles, so they go down extremely quick. They have no defense. It was about at this time I realized that they weren't reacting to me, and they were likely AFK, taking a break or something. So my instinct is to immediately have the Proteus make a play for the Kiki and turn off the Micro. If there is one, it's probably an afterburner to be honest. So we grab a Scram, we're going to put webs with the Loki. And this Kiki Moore is going to be toast. So no reactions at all. These guys got caught snoozing. Up until now, I haven't even decloaked the Pilgrim kept him a bit away as an anti-tackle. So just in case they land something on that saber, I would burn the pilgrim towards it, put drones on it, neuter it out and kill it, and get the other ships out. But no reactions from any of them. So we'll go ahead and jump on the fourth guy. I'm going to hand it back uh, to current commentary. No more voiceover past this point. And we're cloaked up. Everybody's alive. Cool. Those are the guys that bashed my pass. How freaking dare you bash my pass. The question is, will they be back? The answer is probably. Oh, don't shoot the wreck. Oh, I shot the wreck. <laughs> Let's at least loot the Kiki. There might be something in there. We can get the Polaris guns too. Oh, why is my Loki? Oh, I just ran into the Loki. Let's get the, uh, let's get the Loki off. Actually, we can leave you here. Fuck it. What's the worst that could happen? Guess I could combat scan down his capsule or something. I don't know. And you gotta understand, we just killed a bunch of frat guys, so they have unlimited numbers. They could always come back. I'm sure they have the chain, but they already refed my fort or my building, so it doesn't really matter. I still have to do everything I have to do to be safe at this point. So might as well get some kill mails out of it, right? Seem good. Oh, I click scan by accident. Whoops. Cool. We got all the loot. Except for the poor Vexor, which we shot. Let's peel out to some deep safes. Alright, so I have just came back for downtime. And they've sent even more buildings here, this time two oracles. These are the ones that got in my way earlier. So, 
I'm not entirely sure how I want to do this. I feel like... I want to switch to the Sfeeple and try to kill those. Let's go. Let's try it out. The Sfeeple is pretty quick. Let's see what happens. If they scram me, I'll die, but... Feeling their AFK again. Oh. One of them's trying to leave. Went to the sun. See if I can get him. Not sure if he went at zero or what, but. Some combats just in case he went at a hundred. Looks like he went at zero. We'll get him. We got him. Yeah, something tells me you're not going to hit me. With the oracle. <laughs> something tells me you're not going to hit me. <laughs> Good night. So I'm like under his guns, even though I'm moving so slow, just because of the virtue that he's in a bashing fit, right? It's kind of how that works. He has no chance of hitting me. I'm too small, too fast. So, to be clear, these are the two guys, actually, that were shooting my pass. These two. The other three were their friends. Okay, so, we've got a couple minutes left on our shield timer here. I once again had to alarm clock to respond to this, sadly. I do admit that I didn't anticipate having to alarm clock for the nomad lifestyle, but hey, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? Alright, so, basically, I don't suspect anybody's coming to kill this thing. But... You never, never know. So we have all three of our cruisers here. Um, and just in case somebody decides to get a little bit cheeky here, we might go for the quick frag. Okay, so yeah, it definitely looks like nobody came, and the f timer came and went, so, um, does that just stay there? That's weird. Uh, it's just because I had it selected, maybe? 
That's a glitch. <laughs> Look at that box. That's funny. Huh. Alright, so... Essentially, what I believe happens is now, this shield is at 25% and it has to get to 100%, right? So what if I warp... I'm gonna warp the... Pilgrim there and target it and see what the health is. Oh, I was trying to target the force field. <laughs> Alright, so that is the health on that. Let's check our modules. These are full health. So, essentially, what it comes down to is I have to get this to 50% health on the shield. Okay, so, um,. I was originally planning on coming back here and using a Lodgy ship to uh, repair my shield on my POS, right? To get it to 50% because you can't load more Stront in it and online any modules unless it's at 50% shield after a reinforce. So I was planning on going to get Stront and coming back with a Lodgy ship and wrapping it up to 50% shield. However, this thing was at 60% shield when I just checked. And it looks to be about 12 hours or so after when it was reft. So if you're ever in this scenario and you have a small stick that gets reft, you can expect the shield to reach 50% probably about 10 to 12 hours. All right, so we just saw a magnate scanning the C2. So we're gonna go over and just see if we can get a little quick kill on him since we rode past him on the blockade runner. I mean, we literally drove right past him. So we'll just warp to 10 at the high cycle and see if he's still there, I suppose, and see if he just reacts to us targeting him. I mean, we could get the saber, but I don't want to... I, I, yeah, we can't get the saber right now. We'll just leave it at that. This is probably a newer player just trying out exploring or something. I'm not sure, but... Anyway, we'll try to uh, grab a quickie on him. Hello, Magnate. Be cloak. Look how long it takes to target him. I mean, he really should probably react to that, right? One might think. No? Well, I don't think he's gonna last long. Oh, he's moving now. Uh-oh. Yeah, I think it's a new player that just hopped in a hole. Sad times. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the spirits were a bit low with all the drama, so I suppose uh, a little freebie magnate soothes the soul a bit, right? Loot him real fast. Oof, that's a lot of loot. He was stabbed. He could have warped. There's a heron in here. I don't know why. Not sure where he is. Ah, he's there. Not sure what I'm looking at here. This is somebody's alt who hasn't had a Z kill entry for eight years. No, fourteen years. So interesting. There's a heron. Okay. It'd be kind of hard to combat scan him. I think we'd need a Sveeple for it. But he'd probably... Oh, he's not within range. Okay, sick. Yeah, let's get the Sveeple. We're gonna have to be quick on this one. We're not gonna catch him. And if I tried to combat scam him with the Prote with the Loki, it would be a nightmare. So, let's grab the Sveeple. We'll try to scan him and warp to him and burn to him and see if he notices, you know? You know. Hey, there he is. We can catch him. Eighty-three K. I'm off. It's gonna take a while to get there. Let's see what happens. We move pretty quick. 
And we have the benefit of the uh, red giant. To move even faster, but he is quite far away, huh? We're creeping up on him. I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to make it by the time I burn my modules out. <laughs> Oh, crap. Okay, so... That's a problem. He's moving faster than me now. So how do we deal with this? Um... We don't. We pretty much don't. Let's see here. He's going that way. So the way to beat this would be to... Prep this. See if he moves. If he doesn't move, we'll drop combats here, scan on grid, warp to him, burn to him. But we need to repair this first. That's going to take a long time. Hmm. Now he's going there. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we got him. That was more work than a heron should should take, so I'll give him props on that. So this Mastodon right here, uh, I think this is the same guy that just tried to bubble my crane at this wormhole. So I'm gonna, okay. Yeah, you would expect it to warp off since I can't hold it here. See what happens here. Looks like he's not going in. He's got eyeballs on it. What you got, bro? 
in there. <laughs> You're not going in? Okay. Yeah, so once again, I didn't narrate my own fight. I was too busy focusing. And I think that might happen for all of my tripo, uh, triple and quad box PvP fights, so. The first thing that shows up is a Saber, which was presumably cloaked. Because he's not targeting me back. I think he's cloaked. And so a Loki shows up as well, which is interesting. He's already 30 kilometers off of the hole. He's now yellow boxing up all of my ships. Looks like he shot the saber once there for a fair amount of damage. So at this point, I'm already aware that that Loki is artillery. Um, so what that means is he can three shot the saber. So after the second shot, I had to pull him out. So now we see a saber and a Loki here. I lock them all up. And what I'm doing is waiting for that Mastodon to come out. And at this point, I locked the Mastodon up and I scram him with the faction scram of the Proteus and um, I try to point the Mastodon with the Pilgrim as well but I'm not actually sure I got it oh actually I didn't actually apply it there you can see what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to put pressure on the Mastodon here and eat the damage from the Saber and the Loki but sadly at this point it becomes crystal clear that I am outmatched so I begin pulling my ships back through the wormhole into high sec. They have two materials, two sabers, and um, some other fun ships in there as well. So definitely outmatch us. We're going to give them a good fight, and we're going to allow them to break that blockade. And I say allow, but they, uh, they took what they wanted there. Okay, so... With that whole fiasco with Frat coming into my hole and trying to bash my tower and presumably move into the hole, I have come to a number of realizations about my tenure here in Anoikis. Uh, the first thing is that although I don't plan to roll wormholes um, on a regular basis, I do need at least some limited capability to close a wormhole when I need it. Because when a group like, let's just say Frat, or any other group comes into my hole and starts to attack me, perhaps the first thing I need to do after defeating them is closing all of the wormholes I think they could have came in through. And so to accomplish that, we can't really use a battleship since we can't store that inside of the Orca. And even things like sigils are pretty large and vulnerable and we don't want to have to replace them. So the only viable options left are a Hick, a heavy uh, interdictor cruiser, or a yacht. And I've kind of ruled the Hick out for now, because again, I might have to replace it if someone catches it, and the yacht is just a lot slippier. Slippery, er, there you go. So basically, if you've never seen this ship, this is a Victoro luxury yacht, right? Let's look at the name of that. Victorio luxury yacht, right? So this is a really weird ship. It's like a cloaky cruiser with no offensive capability. It's like a limited edition ship. Really, the only thing you have to know about this ship is that it is, I mean, very hard to catch, this ship, since we have managed to get the align time to sub two seconds, as long as we drink this apple. So we have an insta-warping cloaky cruiser. You can kind of see how that is powerful, not to mention we can interdict it, so. Basically how this works is, if I have a hole that I need to close, I just hop into this ship, and then I warp to the hole, and I activate my propulsion module, and then go through the hole, hold the gate cloak, and then we're gonna break the gate cloak, activate the prop mod, cloak up, Reapproach the gate and then go back through the gate with the prop mod up. The reason why you do that is because 
If you look at the ship, we have... Where is it? Um, oh, 10, 10 million mass. 10 million kilograms of mass, right? That's not very much. Some of these wormholes have like 2 billion quotas, right? So you'd have to go through that a million times, right? Um, or a lot of times, I should say. So the way you do that is you actually use a propulsion mod to add 50 million tons to your mass. So now instead of 10 million, we're hitting 60 million per swing. So for a pass and a return, that's 120 mil. You can see suddenly that only takes, you know, a, a more reasonable number of passes. Granted, it will take a long time to close with this, but the idea is in an emergency, we need to be able to do it, okay? One small thing you may have noticed when I was teaching you about how to roll with this was that in order for this fit to work, for it to be sub two seconds, for us to fit an oversized 100 MN prop mod on it, in order for this to work, we had to engage in a system that is brand new to me. And that is the mutaplasmid system. Now, mutaplasmid sounds fancy, it sounds complicated, abyssal afterburners, lots of numbers, it sounds really complicated, but uh, if you're watching this, chances are you've either played of or heard of games like Diablo and Path of Exile and stuff like that. And one of the hallmarks of those games is that you not only have an item, let's just say a sword, but you can also modify that sword to make your sword unique from everybody else's sword. And you can try to get a really good sword, and it's a very exciting part of gameplay. The Abyssal Mutaplasmid system is similar in that. Now, we no longer just have a 100mn afterburner. We have a 100mn afterburner with a bunch of randomized properties. Okay? So my afterburner is probably extremely unique compared to other people's based on the rolls. I mean, there's plenty of ones that are similar and lots that are better than this. But um, what you can do with mutaplasmids, and this is the takeaway here, is you can change the values of certain properties, right? And for this ship to work, let's just show you what I mean. So let's just go into the fitting, and if we remove this module and add a 100 MN afterburner compact on it, look what happens. We're 20 power over. So what I needed to do was to take a afterburner and apply mutaplasmids to it in order for the power grid usage to drop. So if we hover over the power grid on my abyssal afterburner, you're going to notice that it's green, which means that I have modified it with that mutaplasmid to be lower. So the only way to get this fit to work that I was able to find, and granted I was helped with this, um, is to mutaplasmid your afterburner to make it less power grid hungry. Then you could fit it on there. And now the reason we want the 100 MN is because it adds the 50 million tons of mass and dramatically speeds us up. So, What this means is that now we have a ship that we have modified, we have customized a module on it. Um, so I think that's really cool that you're able to do that. And f I was thinking more and more after I did this, I was like, wow, this mutaplasmid system is not just necessarily for like a niche fit like that. We can make use of this for, I don't know, all of our fits in some ways. As long as we understand the system, I think we can make use of it, right? So what I want to do here is I want to actually use a bunch of mutaplasmids on modules that I have and see if I can improve my Loki's fit for a low cost. The first thing I'm going to do is put this faction point on there. I've been wanting to do this for a while. We'll go ahead and put that on there. Now, we have 10 mutaplasmids. We have 5 10 MN afterburner mutaplasmids, decayed. And then we have 5 gravid stasis webifier mutaplasmids. The first word, decayed versus gravid, is the strength of it. The stronger it is, the higher randomized the rolls are, the potentially better the result is, right? Let's make sure my orc is not running away. Okay. So for the afterburner one, um, I think I went with the lowest quality, the decayed. And then for the stasis webify, I went for the middle quality one. What we're going to do here is we're going to use some of these right now. 
and see what the heck happens. See if this is possible to um, potentially uh, maybe get an upgrade on one of our modules. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I guess, unpackage these. I think you might have to do this. I'm not sure, but I'd rather do it now just in case. Insufficient power. So we'll just unpackage all of these mods. Since we're going to be using 10 total mutaplasmids here. And before we start using any of them, I want to talk about the cost of this. Uh, so the five cheap mutaplasmids was a total of like under 2 mil. The five more expensive was 14 mil. And then for the mods themselves, we spent about another 15 mil. So we're spending 30 mil total for this. So we're not really too worried. Um, so we're just going to have fun with this. Worst case scenario, we just use our default mods. So let's just go ahead and use a mutaplasmid. And we'll throw one of our afterburners in there. And hopefully we'll get a maximum velocity bonus. And not nerf the other things too hard. See what happens. Okay, so if it's red, it means it's bad. Whoa. That was a huge velocity bonus. But you see that our other three stats we reduced, right? So we'll probably just burn through all of them and comment on things I think that stand out. Um... Oh, it allows you to do one after the other. Cool. So let's just go burn through these. So this is number two. We got a red. We got a little green. So this one's terrible, right? So we're just going to go through all of them at, at quick speed here. And see what happens at the end. <laughs> Look at that. Plus 0.18. And I think we have two left. So this is number four. Activation cost. Oh, okay. Yeah, none of these are consequential except for the velocity. That's why that first one caught my eye. It was a huge velocity bonus. Okay, so none of those were particularly noteworthy. Okay. Do we have one more? No, we don't. Okay. So what we're left with is 5 Abyssal 10 MN. Okay, and this is the one that caught my eye, this first one. So the ones that were bad, we're going to just chuck them in the Orca. We'll keep this one for now. Now, we're going to apply mutaplasmids to the webs. Let's do that. See what happens. It'd be cool if we got a nice... These are the ones that matter for me, the bottom two. I mean, that's kind of cool already, the first one, but the fact that we don't want either one of these to be red. The bottom line is both of these should be green if we're going to be happy with it, right? So let's go for number two. Okay. Very bad one. I think the optimal range is the most important one for us, but I imagine good players, the velocity is probably more important. Alright, number three. Okay. Not very consequential. Go for four. And the idea is here, we just want to understand the system that we're dealing with here. Ooh. Ooh. We got a double green on number four. See, now this could be worth something for us. Let's go for number five. Just get it out of the way here. That was a big range bonus. We got two that were usable there. Whoa, very cool. Okay, so let's stack this up and just do a quick look and put the ones that are bad away. So I don't think we'll be using that. Or that. Only the double greens will keep. That was these two. Okay. So we're left with two afterburners. Now we can kind of compare these in a way. Um, so th this is going to be the base stats and this is going to be the modified. So the one to the right is right down the middle of this chart. So what we can do is just literally throw this on and observe. So if we simulate, we're going 706 with the burner on, okay? With the regular burner. We're going 670. So it's like a marginal increase, right? Really not a huge upgrade. Um, it definitely increases the power by a lot. But the fact is, uh, it dramatically increases the capacitor the use as well. So this may not be useful for us. You can see how you can kind of think about this, right? And kind of play with the stats and find something that suits you. So we'll leave it on for now. And then we're going to look at the webs. So with a standard web, it goes out to... 
23 kilometers. With the first web, it goes out to 24. And with the last, oops, oops, it goes out to 25 kilometers. And if we overheat that, it goes out to 36. So we just got ourselves a quite long web, which I'm quite happy about. I'm quite happy about that. So we got a bit of a bonus on our web, basically. We got a couple kilometers on it for virtually no cost. So we kind of just jumped into the abyssal system here and learned that for very cheap amounts of ISK, we can modify our cheap modules and make them into something special. Um, now there are a few other things I want to touch about, or I, I should say I want to touch on with the abyssal system that I've picked up on. Um, the first is that there is a website called mutaplasmid.space. I'm gonna pull it up here for you. So this website right here, you see the link up here. This website allows you to look up uh, mods, right? And it, what it does is links you to contracts. So if we go to Webifiers and give it a second to load, all right, we can see a bunch of webs here. And these are all available by contract. So you would click link here if you wanna buy this, go into your game, go to the notepad, make a new note, and then paste that link you just copied, and then you can click on this and open the contract. So you can kind of link the website to the thing, right? Um, so this website it also allows you to check the value of your modules, right? Okay, so price checking your modules is actually not that hard. Uh, just drag your abyssal module right into a chat channel just like before, copy it. Make sure there's only one module per message, though. Don't do more than one. Then you're going to open up Mutaplasmid, go to Appraisal. You're going to paste it here, okay? This should give you your module. Now, I don't quite understand how these work. I think these are based on, like, averages on the site or something like that. Because we have a decent velocity bonus on this burner but I think because most people use uh, the best tier and faction modules to do this this is probably still considered subpar even though it's well above the average so you can see that we didn't really get good mods as you would expect by any type of gambling rolling system um, however we managed to get some significant upgrades we're faster we have a longer web now for like 30 mil you know it's pretty cool I like that um, we're going to continue to engage with this system. Now, I actually like random crafting systems like this. I like random systems. I just don't like random systems when real money is involved, right? So, uh, we'll probably be using the Abyssal system quite a bit moving forward. It'll be pretty cool. I'm quite eager to see uh, how I'm able to leverage that. Now, as I mentioned, the yacht was just one of several ways that I want to improve my ability to defend myself since the uh, incident with the bashing crew earlier. Um, the second way is a pretty obvious one in hindsight, but I just never got around to doing it, never felt compelled. Um, we have anchored a bunch of, uh, what are they called, hardener modules for our POS. And these are like 2,000, 4,000 M3 each, something like that. Uh, but basically, I think you can anchor like f five or six of them to a small pass. But basically what these do is they give the shield resists. So that anybody coming here to bash this is now going to have to take like twice as long to do it. Or something crazy like that. So it doesn't really stop anybody from killing the pass. But anybody that wants to do it now has to take longer to do it. And then if they do reinforce the pass, I'll have even more time to fight them as they... Uh, dwindle the shield down so quite a uh, major upgrade in terms of defense for very little investment we're not going to go with any guns it's kind of pointless for us we're not going to haul around a whole suite of guns so um, yeah we have uh, some other changes coming too we're not going to discuss them quite yet but I can give you hints uh, we're, we're going to add some possibly like refits some doctrine tweaks and stuff to our lineup to deal with potential intruders and um you know we're gonna we're gonna take some steps with 
uh, asset safety. So what I mean by that is that, oh, I guess we can put this online. <laughs> um, we're gonna probably move the orca to like safe locations semi-randomly on a regular basis um, in order to potentially preempt some of the attacks that people might have against me. So uh, if you're watching this and you plan to attack me, there is a semi-decent chance that the Orca is not even going to be logged out within the POS. So um, yeah, we're going to keep making changes and keep being safe. Uh, we haven't really gotten taken advantage of too much yet. Um, I think there was one thing I missed as I wrap this up. Uh, I'm gonna actually pull this in for you right now because I think you deserve to see this because it's really funny. So, I don't, I didn't quite understand how trig standings work, and I managed to lose a saber to get ready for it. An entropic, entropic disintegrator Vader post. So I died to a gate gun. That was a trig standing gate gun. <laughs> I lost the saber to it earlier. Uh, I didn't have my camera rolling because I obviously didn't expect to die. I was just like goofing around in low sec. And um, yeah, so that was pretty hilarious. I really, really wish I recorded myself dying to that gun. We'll, uh, we'll laugh at the kill mill instead. So. All right, guys. It's that time again. So this was a rather unique episode. We... Honestly, saw some really wild things. We got to take a peek at things we shouldn't have seen. We got to get attacked by people that shouldn't be attacking us. And we not only handled it, we spanked them and pounced on them like a tiger. I mean, I'm starting to feel awfully comfortable out here. I'm not necessarily sure I feel good but I feel comfortable and I'm having more and more fun every day I'm out here so yeah thanks for watching appreciate you see you on the next one